Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jesse Planters. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date with all things going on right here at Jesse Planters Ministry. You'll enjoy it, I'm telling you, and you'll never get bored. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to continue my series called I Will Build My Church. Now, uh, I did the part one on the first Sunday in January. Today will be part two, and I'm just going to stay right here in this series as long as the Lord wants me to. I'm not going to even try to guess what he's going to give me from week to week, but I have something for you today for part two that I believe will bless you. But before we go there, I want to just review the four characteristics of the church that Jesus is building, which I listed in, in January in the service. I know you, well, many of you were here. How many of you were here for that service? Some of you may remember these. It's just a, a, a foundation thing that I said back then. Jesus is building a church that is established, number one, on the rock-solid foundational truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Number two, he's building a church that's constructed with new creations of people that have been washed in the blood of Jesus and called together to glorify him. That's what church means, an ecclesia. It's people called together, gathered together, and to glorify him. Number three, number three he is building a church that it, it is empowered by its builder to function in full authority with invincible power over the gates of hell and even death itself. And number four, I told you that the uh, church that Jesus is building is a beacon of truth to the world throughout every generation, brightly illuminating the only way of salvation for the lost. Now let's begin part two. The title of today's uh, message of this series is called Jesus is Building a Victorious Church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is building a victorious church. I don't know about you, when you build something, you don't want it to be mealy and second rate. You want to build the best. And that's what was his heart when he came to the earth. He's building a church that is victorious. And we're going to read our text again, Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read verse 13 uh, through 19 in the King James Bible. They will have it on the screens for you. And it says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom do ye say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, or Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I added that verse today, and I didn't have it in the first week because I wanted to introduce it today, because that day on the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus revealed his three-point plan for building a victorious church. Listen to these points. Number one, his church will be built with people that are born again through a personal revelation of who he is. That's, that's essential. Number two, and we're going to go through each of these points this morning. I hope you brought your Bible. hope you, you're taking notes because it's going to get so big and strong in you. I'm telling you what, you will never be the same again. Number two, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Number three, Give the, he came to give his three-point plan for building a victorious church. The third one was give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to his church. And we're going to go through all of that. Let's turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Let's begin with point number one. His church will be built with people that are born again through a personal revelation of who he is. 
How many people in this house will say that you are born again because you've, asked, you've prayed the prayer and you've asked Jesus to come to your life? I want to see every hand in the house, hopefully. If you're, if you're not able to raise your hand, you will be able to just by listening to these wonderful examples and hearing the word of God. Number one, his church will be built with people that are born again through the personal revelation of who he is. So what does it mean to have a personal revelation of who Jesus is? Well, we're going to read John chapter 3, verse 1 and 3 in the living, New Living Translation. It'll be on the screen, and if you have another translation, it'll be very similar to that. It says, number one, verse one, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Verse three, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now here this person that must have been the most, one of the most religious or uh, theologians of the day, something, one was very familiar with the verses, Jesus told him that he had to do something. You see, that word Greek, that word see in Greek means to see. Not just the mere act of looking, but the actual perception of the kingdom and its realities. He had to look beyond the natural and see something spiritual. The Amplified Version says that word, describes the word see as know, be acquainted with, and experience the kingdom of God. So unless you're born again, you're not going to get this. So you can't explain spiritual things to people that are not born again. We all know this. You know, it's clear that our Savior intended to teach Nicodemus that he had to be born again. It wasn't sufficient for him to be born a Jew. You know, a lot of people think it's okay, I'm, a, I'm already a Christian because I was born into a Christian family. No, it doesn't happen that way. That gives you advantages, but it still has to come to a point where you make that personal uh, decision yourself. It wasn't sufficient for Nicodemus that he was born a Jew. It wasn't enough for him to acknowledge Jesus as a teacher sent by God. You know, a lot of people say, yeah, Jesus was a good man. He was a great teacher. That's not enough to get you into heaven. That's not enough. You have to do something else. It wasn't enough for Nicodemus to acknowledge Jesus to actually be the Messiah. People have said, yes, he's the Messiah, but they haven't made a personal decision themselves to accept him as their personal Savior. Nicodemus, like each one of us, like everybody watching online, like everybody else in the whole entire world today and that will may even be born tomorrow or that ever lived. Like them, Nicodemus needed to experience his own, in his own soul that great change called the new birth or regeneration. You see, Jesus will build his victorious church with people that are born again through a personal revelation of who he is. Now let's look down at verse 16, very familiar verse of scripture. John 3, 16, we're going to read through verse 21, but we'll read it also in the New Living Translation. I think it's just so powerful. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life excuse me, have eternal life. 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. Listen to this. In verse 19, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. That is so powerful and so appropriate, I think, for the times that we live in. How 
Amazing is it that we can see clearer than maybe even a few years ago the difference between darkness and light in our society and in our world. I mean, people, you can either, you can't be in one, in, uh, you have to be in either one camp or the other. If you're not in God's, then you're not, then you're in the devil's camp. The Bible clearly teaches us that. Jesus revealed to this devout Pharisee that the kingdom would come to the whole world. However, he told Nicodemus that he would not be a part of it unless he was personally born again. We cannot overstate this. You know, a lot of people think you just, it's okay if you just do good things or if you're kind to somebody or if you're generous. Some people have tried to pay their way into the kingdom of God. I think Jesse had told me that he heard uh, that Denzel Washington's mother had told her son, you know, you can't pay your way into the kingdom of God because he, he grew up in a godly household, I was told. And he was very generous, and, but it, you, it, you, you can't, that's not what gets you there. Glad you're generous, but that's not what makes the difference between heaven and hell. Amen. 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 Jesus revealed to this devout Pharisee that the kingdom would come to the whole world. Now, this was a revolutionary concept. The kingdom was personal, not national or ethnic. This is a new way of thinking for these people. And it's offered to everyone, people of every character and rank, every nation, moral and immoral, rich and poor, old and young, bond and free, Jew and Gentile. This is for everyone. This is good news. And you know, entrance requirements into God's kingdom are two things, repentance, spiritual rebirth. Very simple. I've often said it this way. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you need a Savior. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. C, confess Him as your Lord. Anybody can tell people that story and get them to the throne of God. Amen? Jesus will build His victorious church with people that have been born again through a personal revelation of who he is. I kept repeating that because I want you to get that in your heart because the people that you meet every day need to know this. They need to know that Jesus loves them, first of all, and that he has a good plan for their life, but they have to accept him as their personal savior. They have to be, they must be born again. If he told it to Nicodemus, that Pharisee, the person who must have been doing everything right, I mean, they had a long list of rules. This guy kept them. He was a good guy. But that wasn't enough. You have to experience him in your heart, amen, to make the difference. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. This is the kind of church that Jesus is building. He first starts with the foundation. If you don't get this part right, I don't care how long you've been in the church, if who's on the roll or how long your daddy's been a deacon or wherever, been, wherever you've been, how many churches you've been affiliated with. Is that the truth? Amen. I'm telling you, we need to get this part right because... We have to put, make Jesus the first place, not tradition, not um, uh, society, not the way people expect things to be. Amen? We're going to look at uh, the second point in Jesus' plan for building a victorious church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. That, is, that was what he said that day to Peter when, he gave that re- when Peter gave him the revelation of who Jesus was. You know, I was thinking about that the other day when he asked them that. This is way back in Matthew chapter 16. You know, a lot of things had happened up till that point. He, they had been following him down the road. They had been with him while they saw him do miraculous things. They probably had heard him when he entered into the temple and he picked up the book of Isaiah and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me, basically declaring I am the Messiah. So when he says, what did people say of him? You would think at least one of those would have said, they, said, they would say, they, they're, tell, they're all talking about how you're the Messiah. But they didn't say that. They had these other ideas. But then Peter spoke out of the Spirit. But I'm telling you what, even in the natural, these people who were church people or religious people should have recognized it. Just shows you how you can be live, you can be attending church all your life and not recognize the power and the presence of God. 
Don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to your family. Let them know that God's presence is a real tangible thing and it must be valued, it must be honored, it must be respected. I'm telling you what, when you, he, he deserves, like we said, all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Hallelujah. Give him a great hand clap in this Pentecostal church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. This is a declaration from the Son of the living God. The plan originated in heaven, and it reveals Jesus' plan for building a victorious church. I love being part of that victorious church. Hallelujah. I love seeing you here, knowing that you're part of that great victorious church that's, that scopes all around the globe. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. We're going to read through verse 21 in the King James Bible. This is so powerful. You've heard this before. I, this is one of my favorite, favorite passages of Scripture. It's one that I often pray in the person, in the first person. He says, verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now this is his prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, let's, let me, let, let's see how he explains that mighty power. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now that's a victorious church. And that's what he sees in you right now. He sees you as equipped. He sees you as powerful. He sees you as filled with his very anointing and presence, well able to handle anything that the enemy throws your way. And he declared it that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you because you are in his church. Stand up for your rights, I'm telling you. Remember that God has something he wants you to declare. And the enemy comes against you and he, his, he's starting to speak and say things that God, against what you know God has told you to believe for, you need to stand up against him and rise up and say, no, those principalities are under my feet. Jesus Christ dwells within me and I'm greater than you. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All my hallelujahs belong to him. You know, this is a perfect picture of the victorious church that Jesus is building. All the forces of hell will never have the power to prevent the advance of his church. Hallelujah. And I tell you what, I'm glad to be an honor to be a member of the church of Jesus Christ globally. Hallelujah. Because I'm born again. That's what made me a member. You know, there's a lot of things, some places you got to be able to go through a whole bunch of um, things to become members of some things. There's an initiation. I'm thinking of a lot of things in the world. There's some initiation things you don't want to go through. But here in the kingdom of God, all you have to say is, Jesus, come into my heart. And there you are, a plop right there, a, a full a member in good standing in the church of Jesus Christ. You see, all the forces of hell will never have the power to prevent the advance of his church. This fact still sends shockwaves of terror to the devil. It sure does. You know what? The revelation of that, the fact that you know it, sends shockwaves to him. Oh, I'm telling you what, the mushroom cloud's coming. 
First you get the wave when you think about the truth. It hits you in the face, oh yeah. And then if you meditate, the more you meditate on it, I'm telling you what, it's like a goes straight up and pop that cloud's out there. And it settles in and affects everything. I'm telling you what, this is power. This is a victorious church. You know, the people of that day expected the Messiah to overthrow the nation's current oppressive rulers. They look into him to fix the, the governmental situation. They wanted him to do things in a physical and a natural way. But Jesus intended to build a victorious church that would demonstrate the defeat of their spiritual enemy. You see, we look at, sometimes we look at things just on the surface, but there's something deeper that we need to be speaking to. The Jews of that day wanted to prevail against Rome. Jesus wanted his followers to prevail against the gates of hell. You know, in ancient cult, Eastern cultures, the meeting place for the community's authority or ruling body was often at the front gates of the city. And long before the city halls that we see, town halls, there were city gates. And these gates were much more than passages that you walk through. They represented access, safety, defense, and vulnerability. And a fortified city was only as strong as its gates. But Jesus foresaw his church as attacking and laying siege to Satan's stronghold, much as an enemy battering ram assaults the gates protecting a city. You know, instead of being always on the defensive, Jesus is calling us to step it up and be on the offense and push down the gates of the devil, the gates of hell. Amen. We need to be pushing that stuff down. But you know, how do you do that? You do that with the Word of God. You do that with the presence of God and the Spirit of God that dwells within you. You know, when you activate this stuff, it, it works. You know, that I've seen it where they have some things, they're two different, two different uh, chemicals, you know, and, and by themselves, they're sort of inert, I think would be the word they would use. They just kind of lay there. But when you put those two babies together, I'm telling you, something starts moving and a bubbling. God wants us to put our spirit together with his spirit and his word together. I let his word come out of our mouth and help us to push down those forces of the devil. Amen? To pull, push down the gates of hell. God is calling us to speak life to those dead situations around us. Hallelujah. Jesus foresaw, foresaw his church attacking, I'm going to say it again, and laying siege to Satan's stronghold. As much as an enemy battering ram assaults the gates of a protected city. There are some of you that have an assignment to tear down something that the enemy has started. And you need to be speaking to that. And the, every time you speak, it hits it. And it doesn't, maybe when you hit it, it doesn't look like it's moving. But you just keep on at it. Keep on at it. Keep on speaking the word of God. Keep on believing. Keep on declaring the promise. And I'm telling you what, it's going to crumble. And you're going to shake the foundations with your praise, shake the foundations with your words and the word of God. Amen? And the prayers of the saints. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Jesus promised that he and his church would prevail over the gates of hell itself. I'm telling you what, I want you to leave this place knowing how strong you are in God. You are invincible. I'm telling you what, the enemy knows your name. And he should be trembling in his boots right now because you are equipped with the power and presence of God and anointed to speak to his defeat. The only problem is so many of us are afraid to open our mouths. He's intimidated us with propaganda telling us that, oh, don't say too much because it's going to get worse. No, you need to keep it up. You need to buy, dial it up. You need to intensify. Don't give up. Don't ever let him think you're backing up. You need to keep staying up. Don't back up. Don't give up till everything that God has called you to receive shows up. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Does your hallelujah to belong to him? Sometimes I'm telling you, when the enemy tells you it's not going to work, all you need to do, if you may not think of anything else to say, just say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
hallelujah. In fact, the whole word, like, hallelujah, hallelujah. You don't even have to say the whole word. It works. It belongs to him. You're declaring that he's in control. Amen. He's bigger than any problem. He's bigger than any, any uh, attack the enemy may throw. Glory to God. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Are y'all there yet? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, when Jesus used the phrase gates of hell, he was describing the spiritual stronghold from which Satan and his legions storm out into the world with the assignment and the intention of deceiving the lost, destroying the witness of the church, and controlling society. So the enemy has a battle plan. That's why it's important that we know that we have a better plan that has been actually uh, initiated and birthed in heaven itself. It's heaven's message today, amen? And he's entrusted us with this holy message of the gospel that needs to be proclaimed. Whoo, hallelujah. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6, I want to read it to you in the Message Bible. It's so powerful. It says, the world is unprincipled. Anybody know that's true? The world is unprincipled. It's dog-eat-dog -dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have, never will. I love that. I could camp right there. That's strong. That's John Wayne strong. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, part. I mean, it's just big. Jess and I watched an old, old John Wayne movie last night before he went, we went to bed early, but he, it, was, it was kind of fun. But you just see that character. God needs to raise up people here in the church that have a strong character, that are not ashamed of what they believe and will boldly declare what God is saying and not affect it if it doesn't change instantly. Amen? Because you know in whom you have believed and you are persuaded that he is able to keep what you have committed to him against that day. God's raising up an army, a victorious church in this house. Hallelujah. How many of y'all got the victory even now? Woo. I'm going to have to say it again. Now, verse 3, the world is an unprincipled. The world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massly corrupt culture. God needs us to stand up as lights in a dark place. No, not everybody in the world is like some that you see that are doing awful things. God has a people that he's raising up that are lights in a dark place. Verse 5 says, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, Ooh, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Verse 6, our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. That's the word of God. You know, the picture here is of a strong, fortified city where the enemy makes his last stand entrenching himself in the walls, about the walls, raising towers, preparing engines of defense and offense again upon the walls to ensure victory. The fortifications, listen to this, walls, towers, and castles, now that's an old culture that you know about, you know what I'm talking about. They are taken down by the gospel and the whole opposition is destroyed and taken captive. So these things that we have, we have understood in the natural that happen in warfare are happening in the spiritual realm. And when we understand how it works, it helps us to get into position to be the tool that God wants us to be in the earth because God is raising us up to be his voices, his hands, his feet in the earth. He has some things he wants said. He has some things he wants done. And he needs people who are equipped with the Holy Spirit that will rise up in boldness and speak and declare what God has said so that he can bring it to pass. Give God a great shout in this house. 
You know, that same teacher who promised his followers that they would become fishers of men also promised his followers that they would prevail against the gates of hell. So don't forget that. God has called you to be a prevailer against the gates of hell. So when the enemy tells you you're not going to win, you say, "Uh uh-uh, no, I'm in the church of God. I'm in the church of Jesus Christ, and I know that he's going to prevail over this situation. Amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16 again. We're going to look at it again in the Amplified Bible. We're going to look at the third point of Jesus' plan for building a victorious church. Number three, he says, give the kings, he came to give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to his church. I meant to go grab a a thing of keys. Anybody got keys in in this house? Just shake your keys if you have keys with you. I want to see keys in the house. Y'all know what keys are about. Keys. So we understand that. He came to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven because you belong in the church. And he wants some things unlocked. He wants some things locked up. He wants some things done in the earth. Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. I'm going to read it in the Amplified Bible. We said it, read it earlier in the King James Version, but this is so strong. It says, verse 18, And I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, a a large piece of rock, and on this rock, Petra, a huge rock like Gibraltar, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. That's strong. Verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful, On earth must be what is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose, declare lawful on earth, must be what is already loosed in heaven. So the meaning of this verse has been a subject of debate for many centuries. People try to use this verse in the wrong way many times. Some say that the keys represent the authority to carry out church discipline, legislation, and administration. Others say that these keys give the authority to announce the forgiveness of sins. Still others say that the keys may be the opportunity to bring people into the kingdom of heaven by presenting them with the message of salvation found in the world. I believe it's that message that Peter had that day that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that that exploded within him, that was revelation from the Father itself, had to come out of him to the others, to others in the world. And that very thing is the key that will unlock any problem, any situation that you may have in life. That understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he lives within me, the very one who who is part of creation, lives and resides within us. That empowers us in a way that nothing else can. No physical key, no other kind of key, no other person on the earth can do that. People have represented themselves as being the key. They're the one with the know-it-all. But Jesus himself has reserved that privilege and honor for himself. Amen. Amen. The religious leaders thought that they hold the keys of the kingdom and try to shut some people out. To bind a thing was to forbid it. To loose it was to allow it to be done. But this does not refer to persons but to things. It says whatsoever, not whosoever. Amen. Amen. Amen? So, for example, if someone is bound by sin, the church can loose him by preaching the good news about the gospel and get them born again. Amen. If someone has maybe a demon oppression or possession, the church, can, the church can bind him by commanding it to go in the name of Jesus. We have authority with the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So there's lots of things that God has already given us as the church, tools and things that we can do to take our position and be his representative on the earth and follow his example. Amen? Amen. Because we cannot decide to open or close the kingdom of heaven for others, but God uses us to help others find their way inside. Isn't that beautiful? We don't need to be a stumbling block to someone else, no matter what stage in their, their life they're in. Some may not know God at all. Some may have just become to, come to know him. Some may have been out there a long time, but they've been listening to wrong teaching. 
but we don't need to be the ones that sit and oppose or object, but we need to be the ones that love. We need to be the ones who God uses to help others find the way inside, inside to his presence, inside of knowing him as their personal savior. To all who believe in Christ and obey his words, the kingdom doors swing open wide. Wow. They sw I mean, the, the kingdom of God is wide open to the whole world. He's not putting stumbling blocks in front of them. The only stumbling block that is there is their rejection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, but the moment that we accept him into our heart, it changes everything. Yeah. He says, behold, all things become new. The new thing is here. Wow. Yeah. Everything changes from here on out. Because God, Jesus says, I will come to build my church. He said, in that church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm giving you the keys. I'm showing you how to do some things. God is going to reveal some things and what you need to do, things you need to say, places in his word that maybe you haven't discovered yet that are going to unlock the thing that has been blocking your answer today. Amen? Give the Lord a great shout in this house. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the... Um, statement for our series is I will build my church and it is a declaration from the son of the living God I said that but I just had to repeat it again as we close because Jesus's plan for building a victorious church is open to all people and I think the Lord is speaking to us today to just remove all the hindrances that maybe we have he has placed us in a in a in a in a circle of influence I believe there are people here that are in a circle of influence that God is going to use you to open up the eyes of people to let them know that door is open for them. Yeah. No matter what the world may have told them, no matter what their religious experience may have told them, God is saying, I am here for all people. All you have to do is invite me in. Doesn't matter how long you've been in church, what matters is, did, are you in the church? Yeah. Do you get the difference? Yeah. Are you in him? not just in a building, not just in a fellowship, but are you in him? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you that you've brought us up to this place today to know that in you, our lives rest. In you, Lord, is the answer to everything that we could need in life. And Lord, I thank you that you're calling us up to, to recognize that. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your presence. Hallelujah. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that's drawing people. Lord, there may be some of you watching online or maybe the other watching through your device. Maybe you're here in the house right now and you've never accepted Jesus into your life. Earlier I told you that it's as simple as A, B, C. First, you have to admit, you know, I'm a sinner. I have to admit, you know, I don't really know God. You have to admit, you know, yeah, I may have heard about him, but I don't really know him in my own heart. You have to admit that maybe you've been playing around and just going through the motions your entire life. Or maybe you're at a part where you knew God in a personal and real way and you heard his voice and you walked in his ways, but you've slipped back for some reason, maybe something attack or something got you off course and you're not where you know you should be with him. But he's saying today, you have to admit where you are before you can go where I need you to go. Once you know, admit that you need Jesus right now, right where you are, right here in this building, once you admit that, that's the first step. Let's say this together. Father, we admit that we need you every single moment of every single day. We call you that. We call on you today. Hallelujah. Next is B. You have to believe. The word tells us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Even once this is thou and their family, your family. So you can be the first person in your family to bring about the change that they need. God can empower you with his message so that others in your family can, can understand and believe. So it's important that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I know there are people that watch us from all over the world. They maybe have never heard the gospel message in this quite this way, but it's essential 
In the same way Nicodemus had to make the decision, we have to make the decision to believe. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. Let's say that together. I believe, I believe that, Jesus that Jesus is the Christ, the, Christ. the Son of the living God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I believe that I'm born again. You know, that second thing is confess, and we kind of did that when we did this simple prayer, but it's so powerful. So A, first you admit that you need him. You can't live life on your own. B, C, uh, conf excuse me, believe. Believe that he is the only answer to every problem eternally and today. And see, confess. Confess with your mouth. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 9, verses, uh, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, that, that uh, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. Help me read the verse. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen. 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 So God wants us to recognize that we believe in our heart, but we must confess it with our own mouth. We have to say what he has done in our lives. Let's say that together. Father, we confess you. We confess Jesus as the Lord of our life. And we thank you, Lord. Because of that simple prayer, we have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your dear son. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place today. Lord, I thank you for new creations throughout this building new creations for those that are watching online. And Lord, recreating, Lord, refreshing lives that are happening even at this moment. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is so good. God is so good.